to give my full judgment. My Lord, I, I just wanted some courtesy from the bar. Sorry? I, I just thought there should be some courtesy in the bar uh, because we have eight councillors and the junior councillor just stood up in, in excitement uh, when the delivery was not over. I just thought we should... Uh, no, 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 no. He, I mean, he's, he's obliged to uh, what the judge has said. So uh, uh, just leave it at that. I mean, for me, it doesn't uh, really make any uh, what. He agrees with the judge, so that is fine. No, I'm saying that if each one of us have to do that, mm. then it render the <laughs> No, no, no. We will, uh, I'll remember that. No, no, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Orengo, please uh, relax. We will uh, we will we'll deal with that. Thank you. <coughs> just continue? just in your key, please go on. Can we have order, please? Can we have order? I will now um, read my full judgment. Uh, perhaps I wait for my the former Attorney General to settle in. I now proceed to give my full judgment, bearing the expounded reasons upon which the dissent is founded. I also adopt the comprehensive pillars analyzing the petition, supporting affidavit evidence, the responses, the party's submissions, included in the opinion of the Amikai Curai and contained in the dissenting judgment of my senior brother, Justice J.B. Ojuang. The starting point of my dissent, I'm going to give you an outline, is firstly, I'm going to look at the proper context of jurisdiction of this court sitting as an election court. And in doing so, a thorough analysis of the remit of this jurisdiction, leading to a conclusion that election causes are rights-centric in nature. I will then analyze the petitioner's case, looking at articles 81 and 86, the process of transmission, the burden and standard of proof. I will weigh the evidence adduced by the affidavits. Look at the access to information orders that were issued by the court. Look at the evidence submitted to the court pursuant to section 12 of the Supreme Court Act. I will look at section 83 of the, Supreme, of the Elections Act and the question of compliance. Finally, I will be looking at preserving the Kenya's electoral jurisprudence conclude, and I would give my determination thereafter. I start first with the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction, and I'd like to set some parameters around this. The first parameter is that the Supreme Court sits as an election court, and that is provided for under Article 160. Uh, on 163.3, where we have exclusive original ju jurisdiction to listen to disputes arising under Article 140. Section 2 of the Elections Act defines an election court as follows. An election court means the Supreme Court in exercise of its jurisdiction under the Constitution or the High Court or the Resident Magistrates Court. So in this case, we are in the presidential election the election court. In the Raila Odinga case 2013, this court clarified the bounds of exclusive, its, its exclusive jurisdiction as follows. A petitioner against the declaration of a candidate as president-elect under Articles 163 and 140 of the Constitution and the Supreme Court presidential election rules is required to present a specific, concise, and focused claim which does not purport to extend the Supreme Court's jurisdiction beyond the bounds set out in the Constitution. The Supreme Court is therefore first, that is the original, only, that is exclusive, and final resort for any party challenging the election of any person to the office of president. It determines the presidential election petitions to the exclusion of all other courts, and this jurisdiction is limited in time. In fact, the Constitution requires one to petition quickly and particularly. This restriction on extent on time is not without basis, 
And again, as decided in Raila Odinga in 2013, the parties must present a clear, concise case supported of cogent evidence. The second parameter is that election causes are right-centric and not form-centric. The particular nature of the Supreme Court's finality on interpretation of the Constitution and the law, and the central theme in elections, that is the right to vote in a free and fair election, presents an, inex presents an inescapable conclusion. The Supreme Court, as an election court, is engaged by the parties in a right-centric cause driven by evidence. And in terms of the case in Peter Munya, the court must not disengage from the Constitution. It is important to emphasize that the Supreme Court, in discharging its mandate as an election court, remains the precedent-setting forum in the country, and its decisions must be carefully analyzed to ensure that a jurisprudential crisis or confusion does not ensue. Were that to happen, the court would have failed the Constitution and the people. These considerations have been emphasized by this court before. In the case of Aramat versus Lempaka and others, I have laid out the relevant paragraphs. The thrust of the foregoing paragraphs can be summed up as follows. The Constitution is Kenya's guiding order. It has organized Kenya's governance character and infused accountable governance, public service, and responsible citizenship. The judiciary, bears the enviable but extremely difficult and rewarding duty of giving the Constitution comprehensible interpretation that is stable, consistent, predictable, certain, and true to the sovereignty of the people of Kenya. Underguarding this sovereignty is the ability of every Kenyan to enjoy his or full human character guaranteed under the elaborate Bill of Rights. A determination of a dispute akin to the one before us cannot therefore mechanically be disposed of without paying due regard not only to the letter or spirit but to the conception of the Constitution itself. At the core of the Constitution is sovereign will. At the soul of the sovereign will are the people and central to the people are their rights. What then is the complete description of an election cause within Kenya's constitutional system. An answer lies in the inaugural, elaborate jurisprudence laid by this court and applied by lower courts in a number of election cases. In Moses Masika Watangula versus Muscari Nazi Kombo and two others, this court held as follows. The description of election petitions as causes sui generis is in every respect opposite. An election petition is a suit instituted for the purpose of contesting the validity of an election or disputing the return of a candidate or claiming that the return of a candidate is vitiated on the grounds of lack of qualification, corrupt practices, irregularity or other factor. Such petitions rest on private, political, or other motivations, coalescing with broad public and local interests. They tether in their regulatory framework from the civil to the criminal mechanisms, and they cut across the plur plurality of dispute settlement typologies. The overriding objection of the Elections Act is to functionalize and promote the right to vote. This requires a broad and liberal interpretation of the Act so as to provide citizens with every opportunity to vote and to resolve any disputes emanating from the electioneering process. The primary duty of the election court is to give effect to the will of the electorate and consequently the court is to investigate the nature and extent of any election offence alleged in an election petition. Accordingly, the happenings that touch on the due conduct of the electoral process come as proper items of agenda in the task of an election court." End quote. Again, in George Mike Panjohi versus Stephen Karaoke and two others, this court held, quote, 
Apart from the priority attaching to the political and constitutional scheme for the election of representatives of the governance agencies, the weight of the people's franchise, interest is far too substantial to permit one official or a couple of them, including the returning officer, unilaterally to undo the voters' verdict without having that matter resolved according to the law by the judicial organ of the state. It is manifest to this court that an error regarding the elector's final choice, if indeed there is one, raises vital issues of justice, such as can only be resolved before the courts of law. Therefore, an election cause is a right-centric cause. At the heart of a petition challenging the results of a presidential election, is the right to vote in a free and fair election. This right is at the epicenter of Kenya's democratic character as a republican state. Interpretation and application of the constitutional provisions touching on elections must therefore be read holistically, with each provision reinforcing the other. This approach has been consistently been applied by other courts in our region and embedded in the theory of constitutional interpretation in our own jurisdiction. I have listed a number of cases, I won't go through them. The third parameter of the court sitting as a court of original jurisdiction is the issue of evidence. Evidence is at the epicenter of any tri trial. The nature of a presidential election petition does not displace the basis of law of evidence outlined in the Law of Evidence Act, which expresses among the powers of an election court is in the summoning and swearing in of witnesses, or as nearly as circumstances admit, as in a trial by a court in exercise of its civil jurisdiction. Article 163 proceedings before this court, although regulated by the Supreme Court Act and the attendant presidential election rules, allow reliance on affidavit evidence. In order for that evidence to bear cogent value, it must meet the demands of proof. This court's role in exercise of its exclusive original jurisdiction ought to be through fact-finding an interpretation of the Constitution and the law in the terms set out in the foregoing <coughs> paragraphs. In cases of factual prerequisites, such as this one, interpretation of the law, devoid of complete and exhaustive factual examination, is by itself an insufficient basis upon which to make a final determination contemplated under Article 142 of the Constitution. The evidence adduced must be clear to show that what was declared was not the result. Electoral processes have assumed a fair presumption of correctness. To rebut this presumption requires proof to a high degree that the resulting declaration is not trustworthy. This is drawn from the democratic legitimacy according, according to elections by the Constitution. The test of invalidating an election must be a clear one. A new election should be conducted only where voters have been completely been prevented from accurately registering their intended preference in numbers sufficient to affect the outcome. A determination to hold a fresh election in terms of Article 143, therefore, in my opinion, should only be made if the following questions are considered, analyzed, and determined conclusively. One, was the final outcome of the election the result of fraud, mistake, or omission, which precluded the certified vote total from correctly aggregating all voters' independent, non-coerced, and non-procured preferences? Two, is the outcome incapable of being trusted to reflect the will of the people? Three, can a reliable outcome be determined in a manner other than holding a fresh election? An attempt to displace elections without proper recourse 
to the stated case and evidence amounts to an unfair dislocation of accrued rights under the Constitution to the people and their elected representatives. The court must protect the rights of the candidates and by the same stroke ensure that the rights of the electorate are not compromised. Only a clearly pleaded and proved case will warrant voiding an election. The right to vote in free and fair elections is violated when a court without comprehensive understanding and analysis of the evidence displaces the electorate by halting an election and deciding the outcome itself. An election, unless clearly proven to be conducted in gross violation of the Constitution and the law, affecting the ultimate outcome must never be taken away from the voters. The electorate, by dint of Article 1 of the Constitution, is entitled to be represented by men and women of their choice. In resolving electoral disputes, the judiciary must set out upon this duty as a judicial, not political actor. In doing so, its guiding force must be the proper exercise of judicial authority granted under Article 159 of the Constitution. It must consider rights, not form. On this basis, I now set upon the legal and factual analysis of my dissenting decision with, again, close reference to the pillars set out in the judgment of my senior brother, Justice J.B. Ojuang. First, I want to examine the philosophy that this court ought to apply in election causes. And I have entitled this in a question, right-centric or form-centric, interpreting and applying Article 38 of the Constitution of Kenya 2010, which way for the Supreme Court sitting as, as an election court? It is not in doubt, in my opinion, that the majority based their decision on an interpretation of Section 83 of the Elections Act, and in doing so, they have read in the provisions of Articles 81, and 86 of the Constitution. They state <coughs> that the electoral process has not met the requirements as listed in those articles. In my opinion and with respect, this is a narrow, restrictive interpretation of the law. I find that the majority, in doing so, limited itself to operational and aspirational constitutional principles but failed to firstly, one, address the substratum of the issue at hand, the ground norm of the Constitution, the sovereignty of the people, and the centrality of the people in the entire architecture of the Constitution. But secondly, they failed, or rather they used, a restrictive test in assessing whether a claim that the right to vote had been violated in any way had actually even been made. Let me set out by re reinforcing the essence of the voter who bears the right of franchise. Justice Albi Sachs aptly captured this essence in the case of August and another versus the Electoral Commission and others, South African case, where he said, universal adult suffrage on a common voter's role is one of the foundational values of our entire constitutional order. The achievement of the franchise has historically been important both for the acquisition of rights of full and effective citizens by all South Africans, in this case, real Kenyans, regardless of race, and for the accomplishment of an all-embracing uh, all nationhood. The universality of the franchise is important, not only for nationhood, but also for democracy. The vote of each and every citizen is a badge of dignity and of personhood. Quite literally, it says that everyone counts. 
The interpretation, that's end of quote from R.B. Sachs, the interpretation and application of the Bill of Rights must not be mechanical or limited to a court's interpretation of legislation. To favor legislation over the Constitution would be an affront to the supremacy of the Constitution. The exercise of the sovereign power of the people in relation to the political processes of the state is first to be found in Article 1, which provides that all sovereign power belongs to the people of Kenya, who exercise their power directly or through their elected representatives, and also delegated to the three arms of government at both county and national level. The second reference to this sovereign power of the people is to be found in the Bill of Rights under Article 38. Uh, under Article 38, 2 and 3, where it says, every citizen has the right to free, fair, and regular elections based on universal suffrage and the free expression of the will of the electors, and every adult citizen has the right to be registered as a voter, to vote by secret ballot in any election or referendum, and to be a candidate. There cannot be any doubt at all that in interpreting and applying any provision of this constitution, the Elections Act and the regulations thereunder, this court must adopt an interpretation that promotes the ground norm in Article 1 and the right to vote in Article 38. Articles 81 and 86 of the Constitution reinforce the right to vote, elaborated under Article 38 of the Constitution. These constitutional provisions or principles must therefore be applied to this core right in Article 38 and not vice versa. Articles 81 and 86 are to be facilitative of the fundamental rights under Article 38, in addition to other provisions of the Constitution. In fact, there are many other articles of the Constitution, legislation and regulations, whose purpose is intended to give effect to, facilitate and support the right to vote under Article 38. In the application and implementation of all those provisions, the centrality of Article 38 as the primary purpose for their existence must never be lost. This was the position elaborated in the case of Evans Kidero versus Ferdinand Waititu, where this court held at paragraphs 137 and 138. Quote, chapter seven of the constitution is entitled representation of the people and bears the subtitle electoral system and process with further subtitle, General Principles of the Electoral System. Articles 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, and 87 all fall under this chapter. It is plain to us that most of the provisions in these articles are rendered in the form of principles, some general, others not so general. And thus expressed, it is unavoidable that most of these principles are not self-executing, which fact moves the judicial forum to center stage as regards interpretation and application. These principles cannot crystallize into deliverables of public goods, such as those in the nature of governance and elections without further legislative action. Thus, Article 82 provides that Parliament shall enact legislation to provide for the conduct of elections. A reading of the majority decision also appears to presume that the only test for ascertaining the credibility, or more correctly, for assessing any violation of the rights under Article 38 lie in Articles 81 and 86. This is not the case. Articles 82 and 83 also go to the specifics of the electoral process that support the right under Article 38. Article 82 and Article 83 address the registration of voters, 
and underline the requirements of the voting exercise itself as simple, accurate, and taking into account those with special needs. Article 83.3 states clearly, quote, administrative arrangements for the registration of voters and the conduct of elections shall be designed to facilitate and shall not deny an eligible citizen the right to vote or stand for election. The upshot being that the tests for assessing a violation claim under Article 38 must be more comprehensive than the aspirational guidelines set out under Articles 81 and 86. Cherry-picking constitutional provisions to determine a right-centric cause on the basis of formal considerations, which is the choice of form over rights, undermines a purposive approach to the interpretation and application of the Constitution. The Constitution in Article 259.1 also clearly sets out the framework for applicable principles interpreting the Constitution. And this article provides that this Constitution shall be interpreted in a manner that advances the rule of law and the human rights and the fundamental freedoms in the Bill of Rights. Further, the Constitution under Article 23 states, in applying a provision of the Bill of Rights, the court shall develop the law to the extent that it does not give effect to a right of fundamental freedom and adopt the interpretation that most favors the enforcement of a right of fundamental freedom. In my humble opinion, the majority has not given effect to the people's right to franchise and have not interpreted broadly and in a manner that most favors its enforcement. The case for the advancement of the Bill of Rights clearly must therefore be at the forefront of any judicial determination under the Constitution of Kenya. There is a more complex issue that must be addressed. Article 19 of the Bill of Rights states The Bill of Rights is an integral part of Kenya's democratic state and is the framework for social, economic, and cultural practices. The purpose for recognizing and protecting human rights and fundamental freedoms is to preserve the dignity of individuals and communities and to promote social justice and the realization of the potential of all human beings. The rights and fundamental freedoms in the Bill of Rights, A, and are not granted by the state, B, do not exclude other rights and fundamental freedoms not in the Bill of Rights, and C, are subject only to the limitations contemplated in this Constitution. If the rights under Article 38 may not be limited other than by a specific provision of the Constitution, can an interpretation of Articles 81 and 86 purport to take the essence of those rights away from any Kenyan? Where a voter has made his choice known, having been registered in accordance with Articles 82 and 83 and 138 of the Constitution, having voted in accordance with Articles 81 and 83, and his vote counted at the polling station under Article 138.3c, and the result announced at the polling station in accordance with the Constitution and the law, and that outcome is known and uncontested, then can a general principle, non-specific to any precise act, overturn that choice and undermine, and undermine a fundamental right? Can an operational aspect of an election, such as Article 81, cancel a result or outcome as provided under Article 38 that is unchallenged? And further, where in fact the election is not challenged as to the aspect that the results or outcome has been violated, 
Can a claim that does not plead violation of a fundamental right extinguish the enjoyment or exercise of that right? Can it be argued that there are two competing provisions of the Constitution? One provision guaranteeing the right and the other burdening the enjoyment of that right. And if this is the case, how would one balance to ensure an outcome that does not upset the will of the people? We can draw lessons from the observations of Professor Rex Martin on his exhibition, on his, ex on his exposition of John Rawls' theory of justice in his book, Rawls and Rights, where he states, quote, the weight of a right is a determination, sometimes explicit and sometimes not, sometimes quite exact and sometimes rather imprecise, of how it stands with respect to other normative considerations and whether it would give way to them or they to it in cases of conflict. Similarly, a scholar, Nur Kayan, in her paper, How to Resolve Conflicts Between Fundamental Constitutional Rights, puts across an interesting point, which I fully agree with, that, quote, the discretion that the judges enjoy when applying the balancing method is part of their duty as guardians of the law. One general rule which embraces all situations in which a conflict occurs and gives a common technique to resolve them all cannot possibly be formulated. Even if a single solution was to be formulated, it would not serve justice in each situation, since every case has its own specific circumstances. Also, the discretion of judges is not without any limits. They have to follow the principle of proportionality. The answer to the question how to resolve conflicts between fundamental constitutional rights is, at the end, quite simple. Balancing. Thus, even though there may appear to be a perception that a competing rights situation exists, that is between Article 38 and 81 and 86, there must be a balancing and an application of proportionality to effect a judicial outcome that serves the dictates of the Constitution. One must recognize that not all claims will be equal before the law. Some claims have been afforded a higher legal status and greater protection than others. While there are many situations in which rights, principles, and values may seem to conflict or compete when evaluating situations of competing rights, human rights, particularly those provided in a Bill of Rights, will usually hold a higher status than principles and values. This rationale is further underlined by the architecture of our Constitution, which actually ring fences the Bill of Rights from amendment, which may only be made through referendum by the people of Kenya, and like the principles in Article 81 and 86, which may be amended by elected leaders in Parliament. This plebiscite protection in itself places the Bill of Rights higher in the pecking order of competing provisions in the Constitution. The principle, therefore, should complement the right and not vice versa. The principles in Article 81 and 86, therefore, cannot trump the fundamental rights as provided for under Article 38. And certainly, they cannot undermine the provisions of Article 1 on the sovereignty of the people. Further, they ought not to compete with all international treaties that provide and, pro provide and protect the right to vote and to which Kenya is a signatory and which are part and parcel of our constitutional order under Article 2. We can go further to draw from decisions of the Indian Supreme Court as relates the conflict between fundamental freedoms and the directive principles in the Indian Constitution. Harmony between aspiration, reinforcing or guiding provisions and rights is however critical. In India, the constitution provides for both fundamental rights and directive principles. The Indian Supreme Court has, in a number of judgments, called these principles the conscience of the constitution and also as the core of the constitution. 
That court has held that the courts can look to the directive principles for the purposes of interpretation of a fundamental right and adopt that interpretation which makes the fundamental right meaningful, meaningful and efficacious. But more importantly, the Indian Supreme Court has pronounced itself on instances where there is a conflict between the fundamental rights and the directive principle. And it has held in a number of cases, which I have quoted, I'll not go into, that the chapter on fundamental rights is in the Constitution is sacrosanct. And the directive principles have to conform to and run subsidiary to the chapter on fundamental rights. The conclusion may therefore be drawn that fundamental rights constitute the foundation of any constitution and any accompanying values and principles are to be complementary and not to detract from the constitution. The rights in Article 38 remain central to any election cause and it is claim of the violations of those rights under Article 38 that ought to take center stage in such a cause and not the form that accompanies it in the periphery. Having determined, therefore, that election causes are rights-centric in nature, and having discussed the centrality of the citizens' rights to a free, fair, regular election based on universal suffrage, and the free expression of the will of electors for any public body or office established under the Constitution, I am now going to evaluate the alleged violation of Articles 81 and 86 of the Constitution of Kenya and its effect upon the outcome of the presidential election that is in dispute before us. Now, <clears throat> The case of the petitioners is that they were massive, systematic, systemic, and deliberate non-compliance with the Constitution and the law, which contravened the principles of a free and fair election under Article 81E, as read together with Sections 39, 44, and 44A of the Elections Act and the regulations thereunder. The petitioners assert that the relay and transmission of results from the polling station to the constituency and the National Tallying Center was not simple, accurate, verifiable, secure, accountable, transparent, and prompt, contrary to the provisions of Article 86. The petition elaborated that the non-compliance was on the Form 34's A's and B's, which is that the data and information recorded in Form 34A at individual polling stations <coughs> were not accurately and transparently entered into the KIMS kits, B, that the data en entered into the Kim's kits ought to have been accompanied by an electronic picture or image in the prescribed form 34A. C, that the practice manual verbally communicated and publicly demonstrated by the first respondent to the parties and stakeholders demonstrated that the transmission of any data from the Kim's kit was only possible if the data was simultaneously accompanied by the image of the form 34A. D, that the results from over 10,000 polling stations were not accompanied by an electronic image of Form 34A. E, that the data being, public dis being publicly displayed by the first respondent was not consistent with the information on Form 34's A. F, that the first respondent received in excess of 14,000 defective returns from polling stations affecting over 7 million votes. G, the information on Form 34B did not correspond with that in the primary Form 34A, making them inaccurate, unverifiable, and invalid. H, that the inconsistencies in Forms 34B accounted for at least 7 million votes. I, at the time of declaring the results, the first respondent did not have one 187 forms 34B. J, the computation and tabulation of results in a significant number of forms 34B was not accurate, verifiable, and internally consistent. K, 
The purported results in the first respondents from 34B were materially different from what the first respondent publicly relayed and continued to relay as at the time of filing in its website or portal. <coughs> L, that the results in Form 34B were inaccurate and had mathematical additions in favor of the third respondent. M, that some of the returns in a material number of polling stations were not in prescribed Form A or Forms 34A or 34B, contrary to the regulations. N, that Form 34N bore fatal irregularities affecting 14,078 polling stations. O, that a number of forms and returns were not signed, some forms did not indicate the names of the returning officer, some did not bear the IEBC stamp, some forms 34A and 34B did not bear the signatures of the candidate's agents, nor the reason for refusing to sign, some were signed by the same person presiding in different polling stations, and P, in more than half the constituencies, the returning officers failed to indicate the number of form 34As handed to them as required under the laws and regulations. As such, it is alleged it was impossible to authenticate and verify the results given, to, given as the integrity of the forms had been put into question and the forms were unknown to the law. There's also allegations uh, on the, of fraud on the part of the first respondent that the accusation is that the first respondent selectively manipulated, engineered, distorted the votes cast, and counted in favor and inflated those in favor of the third respondent, thereby affecting the final results tallied, that the presidential election was marred and compromised by intimidation, improper influence, or corruption, and that the third respondent with impunity contravened the rule of law through the use of intimidation, coercion, and public officers. There is also allegations of vote counting that a number of votes in significant number of polling stations were not counted, tabulated, and collected in accordance with Article 86B and C. There is also complaints about the transmission process stating that the respondents' process of relaying transmission votes from the polling stations to the constituency tallying centers and the national tallying center was not simple, accurate, verifiable, secure, accountable and transparent and prompt, that the IEBC deliberately or negligently compromised the security of the Kims and therefore exposed it to unlawful <coughs> interference by third parties. The evidence was presented through 12 dispositions, affidavits sworn by Raila Odinga, Stephen Kalonzo Musioka, Dr. Nyangasi Oduo, George Kigoro, Benson Wasonga, Godfrey Osotsi, Ibrahim Mohamud, Mohamed Nur Bar, uh, Moses Wamuru, Olga Karani, Apriel Oichoi, and Koitemet Olakina. This evidence, together with a complete uh, record of the responses, again, is contained in the dissenting opinion of Justice Ojuang. I will not repeat it. I just go straight to the analysis. The perti pertinent issues for consideration in this regard, in light of the pleadings, the evidence and submissions, ought to evaluate the provisions of Article 81 and 86 of the Constitution in the broad scheme of electoral prerequisites mandated by the Constitution. Article 81 outlines the general principles of the electoral system. Kenya's electoral system is instituted on the basis of a multi-party democracy founded on the national values and principles outlined in Article 10 of the Constitution. Most, most importantly, the Constitution provides a formula for the election of the president. More than half of all the votes cast and at least 25% of votes cast in each of more than half the counties. For the other five elective posts in a general election, the applicable system is first past the post. The person with the most number of votes is the one to be declared the winner.
The electoral system and process is therefore discernible from a holistic reading of the Constitution, particularly Chapter 7, the representation of the people, 8, the legislature, 9, the executive. The general principles under Article 81, which in my view are qualitative, are infused in the entire fabric of these chapters and their resultant legislation are con con concretized by other provisions of the Constitution, including Article 38, Articles 10, 27, 38, 56, 82, 90, 91, 100, uh, 54, 56, 82. There's universal suffrage under 38 again. Secret ballot under 38. This collectivity and interlocking nature of constitutional provisions in the scheme of rights, values, principles, and administrative directives are then infused in the Elections Act and regulations. And therefore, in determining the claims of commission or omission in electoral disputes, a court must consider the following things. A, the nature of the commission or omission in general. B, the source of such omission or commission. C, foreseeability and mitigation. For example, could the IEBC, no, could the commission or omission be foretold? And were there steps taken to avert it? D, the effect of the commission or omission on a right, a duty, or the consequence of the duty thereof, such as effect upon the result of an election. E, the effect of the commission or omission on the individual and the collective. And finally, the court ought to look at possible remedies and directions. The rationale of these considerations may be drawn from the case of Mike Wanjohi, where at paragraph 110, this court stated, by the design of the general principles of the electoral system and of voting in articles 81 and 86 of the Constitution, it is envisaged no electoral malpractice or impropriety will occur that impairs the conduct of elections. That is the basis for the public expectation that elections are valid until the contrary is shown through a recognized legal mechanism founded in the law or the Constitution. Any contest as to the credibility, fairness, or integrity of elections belongs to the courts. The charge of commission of administrative error, fraud, deliberate misconduct, or element of corrupt practices are questions, to go, are questions that go to the root of the validity of the elections, and which, if apparent subsequent to the declaration of results, are expressly excluded from the scope of the dispute resolution of the IEBC. So 81 is qualitative. Article 86, on the other hand, bears a strict quantitative language regulating voting at an election. This article requires that the voting method be simple, accurate, verifiable, secure, accountable, and transparent. The petitioner's claim is that the results from the polling stations right up to the national center could not be verified by the ag their agents. The process of verification is not a two-step process. Verification in a presidential election is a continuous process traceable from the date of registration to voters to the determination of the presidential election petition in an election court. In other words, the plurality of persons engaged in a conduct of elections, including the ultimate determination of the election's validity, are all agents of verification in ascertaining the credibility of an election. To examine the integrity of an election, the election court is obliged to consider all the relevant steps of the verification process and we shall examine the role of each one of them. First, let us go to the agents of verification. First, there is the IEBC. This IEBC, established under Article 88 of the Constitution, is mandated to conduct and supervise elections, and they have other 
duties and obligations such as continuous registration of voters, the revision of the voters' role, facilitation and observation and monitoring and evaluation of elections. And the Independent Electoral Boundaries Act also outlines the powers and functions of the Commission. The second agent of verification is the public. Section 6 of the Elections Act mandates the Commission to avail the register of voters to be inspected by the public at all times for the purposes of rectifying particulars. So verification of one's registration details, including biometric data, is therefore a critical part of verification, essential to the conduct of the election and enjoyment of the right to vote. This assures the public of the correctness of registration details entered into the register and guarantees key components of the right to vote under Article 38. I note that this process was undertaken in the months of May and June this year. Another agent, verifying agent, are the candidates and their agents. So, the Elections Act empowers a political party, a nominated agent, an independent candidate, to nominate their agents per polling station. And these agents are the eyes of the candidates and they verify at every stage where they are to be found. Another agent is the political party in itself. So you have first the candidate, then the agents, and then the political party. Another agent is the constituency returning officers who, for the purposes of this election, collated and announced the results from the polling stations and submitted the collated results to the National Tallying Center. They are also the presiding officers. They are also verification agents. They are the ones who ensure the voting is done properly, that the stations are closed on time, that the counting is done properly, and that all the results are properly recorded. Another agent of verification are representatives of the electronic and print media. And this is provided for under the regulations. So they actually have a regulatory role as agents of verification. Then they are the observers the local and international observers who are also accredited by the Commission and who under the Elections Act Regulation 94-6 are required to submit their official reports to the Commission. And therefore, the reports so filed have a formal and official status. They are not to be casually looked at. All the international observers who observed the general elections termed it as fair and free. That is in the reports that they filed. And there are fundamental questions to be considered. What was the input of their reports with regard to the fairness of the election? What is a free and fair election? What did the election observers consider? International election observers are bound by the Declaration of Principles for International Election Observation an international instrument, which says, quote, the systematic and comprehensive and accurate gathering of information concerning the laws, processes, and institutions related to the conduct of elections and other factors concerning the overall electoral environment, the impartial and professional analysis of such information, and the drawing of conclusions about the character of electoral processes based on the highest standards for accuracy, information, and impartiality of analysis. International election observations should, when possible, offer recommendations for improving the integrity and effectiveness of electoral and related processes while not interfering and thus hindering such processes. International election observer missions are organized efforts of governmental and international non-governmental organizations and associations to conduct international election observations. Despite not having a universally acceptable definition, 
sorry, definition of a free and fair election, there are certain common attributes to that description. They were actually expressed by the Constitutional Court of South Africa in the case of PAM and others versus the Electoral Commission and another as follows, quote, there is no internationally accepted definition of the term free and fair elections. Whether any election can be so characterized must always be assessed in context. Ultimately, it involves a value judgment. The following elements can be distilled as being fund of fundamental importance to the conduct of free and fair elections. First, every person who is entitled to vote should, if possible, be registered to do so. Second, no one who is not entitled to vote should be permitted to do so. Third, insofar as the elections have a ter territorial component, as is the case with municipal elections where candidates are in the first instance elected to represent particular wards, <clears throat> the registration of voters must be undertaken in such a way as to ensure that only the voters in that particular area are registered and permitted to vote. Fourth, the Constitution protects not only the act of voting and the outcome of elections, but the right to participate in elections as a candidate and to seek public office." End quote. I've also uh, laid out another case in which the discussion of what is free and fair and what are the standards of free and fair election uh, set out, and that is in the new National Party of South Africa versus the government of the Republic of South Africa and others. Finally, as a verification agent is the election court. Let me reiterate Kenya's electoral system is instituted on the basis of multi-party democracy, founded on national values and principles outlined under article at, outlined under articles 10 of the constitution. The general principles of the Electoral system, therefore, and the interlocking, interlocking constitutional provisions, including Article 81, are engaged in an exercise of sovereign guardianship. Therefore, the Supreme Court, by dint of its jurisdiction, is the final verifying agency, if called upon to do so in a presidential election petition. This duty is enabled by the Supreme Court's inherent powers as an election court to order A, scrutiny, B, recount, C, retally, D, discovery of documents, E, inspection of ballots, and F, orders that facilitate the court to establish the people's sovereign will. The Supreme Court, as an election court, is empowered by Article 138.3c, Articles 140 and 163.3, and also under sections 2, 80, 82, 85 of the Elections Act. It is critical to meet the constitutional imperative set upon the court and the electoral body by the constitution. An election court must make sure there is a solid, not imagined, proved, not alleged, case for invalidating an election. The South African uh, Constitutional Court in CAM and others remarked and I'm fully persuaded by the opinion as follows. It is undesirable to articulate a general test expressed in language different from that in the Constitution, as that, that may be misleading. The court must give full weight to the constitutional commitment to free and fair elections and the safeguard it provides to the right and ability of all who wish to offer themselves for election to public office. It is essential to hold the IEC to the high standards that its constitutional duties impose upon it. It is insufficient for the court to say that it has a doubt or a feeling of disquiet or it is uncomfortable about the freedom or fairness of the election. No, the court must be satisfied on all the evidence placed before it that there are real and not speculative or imaginary grounds for concluding that the election was not free or fair. Now, having talked about who the agents of verification are, then let's discuss, or let me talk about, what are the stages of the process of verification. 
Regulation 68 provides that ballot papers, ballot papers, shall contain the name and symbol of the candidate validly elected, contain the photograph of the candidate where applicable, be capable of being folded up, have a serial number or combination of letter and number printed on the front, and have attached a counterfoil with the same number or combination printed thereon. These features allow candidates or agents present at the polling station to inspect and verify the ballot paper that is going to be used at the polling station. Then Regulation 69 outlines the voting procedure, which contains the core components of verification which are complemented by the requirements of inspection and verification of the voter's register. And it says, before issuing a ballot paper to a voter, an election official shall, A, require the voter to produce an identification document, which shall be the same document to be used at the time of registration as a voter. B, ascertain that the voter has not voted in that election. C, Call out the number and name of the voter as stated in the polling station register. D, require that the voter place his fingers, his or her fingers, on the fingerprint scanner. Cross out the name of the voter from the printed copy register once the image has been retrieved. And in the case, and in case the electronic voter identification device fails, to identify the voter, the presiding officer shall invite all the agents and candidates in the station to witness that the voter cannot be identified, to complete the form verification form 32A in the presence of the agents and candidates, identify the voter, and once identified, issue the voter with the ballot papers. A voter shall in a multiple election be issued with the ballot papers for all the elections therein at the same time, and after receiving the ballot papers, cast his vote without undue delay and submit one finger to be dipped or marked in an ink of distinctive color so far as possible is sufficiently indelible to leave a mark for the period of election and where the voter has no finger make a mark on the next most suitable part of the body and upon collecting his identification documents immediately leave the polling station a person who knowingly fails to place a ballot paper issued with him or her, not being a spoiled ballot paper, into a ballot box before leaving the place where the box is, situation, the, the box is situated commits an offense. An election officer who, delivered, who deliberately refuses to stamp any ballot paper commits an offense. The presiding officer may, where the voter so requests, explain the voting procedure to such a voter. Then at the close of the polling, the presiding officer is supposed to indicate in the polling diary the numbers of the ballot uh, papers issued to him, the number of the ballot papers other than the spoiled ballot papers issued to voters, the number of the spoiled ballot papers, the number of the ballot papers remaining unused, all in the presence of the candidate or agents. And seal and put in tamper-proof envelopes those and use ballot papers before they proceed to count and then seal those boxes with the ballots that have been counted. The preservation of election material for a period of three years is also an enabler of the verification process. In cases where a court is in grave doubt as to the outcome of an election, as the majority in this case decided they were. The ballots exist to enable a final inspection or verification process by the court. The people speak through the ballot, and the ballots once marked cast in turn speak for themselves, anonymous of the voter, pre preserving the principle of secrecy under Article 38. India's long constitutional tradition has given the Supreme Court an, an opportunity to rein in on the importance of ballots in the verifying of the result of an election when in doubt. They have said this, I quote, this is in the case of Narendra 
Madi Valapa, Kenny versus Manikarao Patel and others. Quote, the ballots are alive and available and speak best. Why then hazard a verdict on flimsy grounds of oral evidence rendered by interested parties? The vanquished candidate's ipse dixit or the victor's vague expectations of vo voters' <coughs> loyalty, the grounds relied on, are shifting stands to build a firm finding upon, knowing how notorious is the cute art of double-crossing and defection in electoral politics and how undependable the testimonial lips of partisans can be unless authenticated by surer corroboration. Chancy credulity must be tempered by critical appraisal, especially when the return by the electoral process is to be overturned by unsafe forensic guesses. And where the ground for recount has been fairly laid by testimony, and the ballot papers which bear clinching proof on their bosoms are at hand, they are the best evidence to be looked into. No party can run away from the indelible truth, and we wonder why. The learned judge avoided the obvious and resorted to the risky. Maybe he thought reopening and recount of ball ballots may undo the secrecy of the poll. We are sure that the correct course in the circumstances of this case is to send for and scrutinize the ballots for the limited purpose of discovering whom, how many of the invalid uh, ballots had been cast. Secrecy of the ballot shall still be maintained when scrutiny is conducted, and only that part which reveals the vote shall be open for inspection. The elaborate process of counting votes outlined under our Regulation 76 guarantees several things. That the vote counting is systematic and transparent in the presence of candidates and agents, and that it is verifiable as the presiding officer maintains a record of count in a tallying sheet in Form 33. After completing the count, the presiding officer immediately announces the results of the voting at the polling station before community, community, communicating the results to the returning officer. The presiding officer requests each candidate and agents present to append their signature. The presiding officer provides each political party, each candidate, or their agent with a copy of the declaration of those results. And the presiding officer affixes a copy of the declaration of the results at the public entrance of the polling station where it's accessible to the public at the polling station. This allows candidates or agents to verify the tally of these results at the, at the polling station, at the constituency telling center, and to raise any objections to any manipulation or change of the results. This is in line with the principle in the Joho case that results at the polling station are final, and any challenge to those results can only be brought before a court of law. Signatures by the candidates or their agents are central to the declaration that where not provided a record of reasons for failure to sign shall be provided by either the candidate or the agent. Failure by the candidate or the agent to sign the declaration, however, shall not in itself invalidate the results announced. That is a provision of Regulation 79.6. The presiding officer is also required to record the absence of any candidate or agent and the absence of candidate or agent at the signing of the declaration shall not also of itself invalidate the results announced. An added layer of verification is provided under Regulation 80, where the candidate or agent after counting is completed may require the presiding officer to have the votes rechecked and recounted. The presiding officer may also on their own initiative have the votes recounted. This regulation is couched as a limited right to be enjoyed by the candidates or agents at most twice. The importance of these processes bears credence to a careful consideration of the history of electoral practice in Kenya, as was highlighted by my good friend and former CJ Mutunga, former president of the Supreme Court, in his concurring opinion 
in the case of Gitarao Peter Munya and Dixon Kithinji. He says at paragraph 235, the emphasis on free and fair elections through an electoral system that is simple, accurate, verifiable, secure, accountable, and transparent in articles 81E and 86 of the Constitution has a rich Kenyan historical, economic, social, political, and cultural context. Article 86B, for example, provides that the votes cast are to be counted, tabulated, and the results announced promptly by the presiding officer at each polling station. This is because our electoral history is rife with malpractices that occur during the transportation of ballot boxes from polling stations to constituency counting centers. It is therefore no coincidence that many petitions filed in the High Court before the promulgation of the Constitution 2010 gave lurid details of the stuffing of ballot boxes or discarding of them en route to the constituency counting center. At the constituency counting center itself, votes disappeared when lights, either by design, negligence, or power outage went off. Our elections were therefore not free, fair, and peaceful. Constitutional provisions are by themselves not enough. The duty bearers, be they individual voters, political parties, agents, the media, the IEBC, the registrar of political parties, the constitutional commissions, the arms of state, must all invest in, em in, em in emancipating and protecting the vote. Once the Constitution gives the citizens the right to vote, the freedom to choose, and the conditions created for the realization of that right, it is not the business of the court to aid the indolent. If party agents are required to be present, sign statutory forms, and undertake any other legitimate duty that is imposed upon them as part of the political process in an election, then they are under obligation to do it. To fail to do so is not only to fail one's party, but also to fail our democracy. The courts must frown upon any such inaction, reluctance, or delay. The election, I'm continuing with his judgment, the election is first and foremost the citizen's election. Every Kenyan must protect his or her vote to right, the right to participate in the political affairs of the nation. It is upon exercising all the rights which the Constitution bestows upon the citizen that he or she can claim the sovereign power that he or she donates to his, he, his or her representative. It is therefore time for us to develop it is therefore time for us to develop our election petition litigation. We must depart from the current practice in which a petitioner pleads 30 grounds for challenging an election, but offers, but only prefers cogent evidence for three. A candidate or her agent cannot abscond duty from a polling station and then ask a court to overturn the election because of her failure to sign a statutory form. Every party in an election needs to pull their own weight to ensure that the ideals of Article 86 are achieved, that we shall for once and for all have simple, accurate, verifiable, secure, accountable, transparent elections. The election belongs to everybody and it is therefore in everybody's collective interest and in everybody's collective and solemn duty to safeguard it. Given the strict electoral times in our constitution, it is clear that this collective constitutional responsibility to ensure a free and fair election will result in cogent grounds which election result, when election results are challenged. We will then start seeing candidates conceding defeat in elections because they have been free and fair. We will then start seeing electoral litigation that may be ended through consent of parties because they agree that the grounds upon which the electoral results are based are solid and not frivolous. It is not hard to imagine that one day it will be possible because of the vigilance of the citizens and all electoral stakeholders to have elections that will be free and fair and the courts will no longer be involved in the settlement of electoral disputes." End quote. 
The next stage of verification is the process of tallying. Outlined under Regulation 83, the returning officer at the constituency is mandated to collate and publicly announce the results from each polling station in the presence of candidates, agents, and observers if present. It is important because, sorry, Regulation 81 is important because it, prever it preserves the election material for reference by an election court where applicable and which, in my opinion, is the final verification Avenue. Under Regulation 81, the presiding officer upon the completion of a count, including a recount, shall seal in each respective ballot box A, the valid votes, B, rejected votes, C, unused ballot papers, D, counterfoils, E, copy of election results, declaration forms, and stray ballots. The presiding officer shall deliver to the returning officer the sealed ballot boxes, the statements made under Regulation 78 and 9, and a copy of the voters' register and the polling station diary. Verification, therefore, is an exercise that comprises the entire electoral process, commencing from the registration of voters, inspection of voters' register, verification of registration, verification of an elector's details where the electronic identification fails, audit of the register, identification of voters, presence of candidates, agents, uh, accredited observers and the media, the process of counting, the limited right to recount, signing the declaration forms and entitlement of the candidates or agents to a copy, displaying the declaration of results for access by the public, sealing of the ballot boxes and handing over of election materials, the tallying process and the right to challenge the declaration of results in an election court. All these processes activate several inbuilt principles of the electoral principle under 81, Article 81 of the Constitution. They also provide an opportunity for electoral quality assurance aptly described in the cited excerpt from the concurring opinion of Mutunga CJ and P as he then was in the Kidero case. The hierarchy is that any shortfalls in the proceeding process can be detected in a consequent process forming a basis for a pre-election or post-election dispute. <coughs> it is, however, to be observed that a proper test for verification of an election process must always prioritize the primary instrument for declaration of the results or outcome of the voter's choice. The voter is identified at the polling station. His votes, he votes at the polling station. The ballots are counted at the polling station. The agents, candidates, and observers are allowed access into the polling station to verify the inner sanctum of the voice of the electorate, the altar of the vo voter's choice. What happens there is what determines the parameters of verification. Any doubt as to the credibility or integrity of the election must be tested against the various layers of verification, including the election material in the custody of the returning officer. A single want of form in this elaborate scheme of verification cannot be the basis of nullifying a presidential election. I now would like to move on to the issue of transmission. At the heart of the transmission was the application by the directions of the Court of Appeal in the Mainakiai case. Before, before delving into the primary manual and complementary electronic modes of results transmission, I will revisit this decision and its bearing on the conduct of future elections. The petitioner's case in their written submissions states that the determination of the Court of Appeal in my Nakiai case was that a polling station was the final point of declaration of the presidential election results. The petitioners contend, however, that the first respondent went contrary to this determination, declaring the final results of the presidential election at the county, failing to electronically collate, tally, transmit the results accurately, allowing transmission and display of unverified results not provided for in law, 
all seeing contradictory and ever-changing results in Form 34s A and B in the portal, and declaring final results of the presidential elections on the 11th August before receiving all results from the polling stations. According to the petitioners, the only lawful, credible, and secure way to conduct tally transmit the 2017 elections was as provided under 39 1C of the Elections Act. The electronic transmission in the prescribed forms and in a prompt and efficient manner. It was the petitioner's submission that the Court of Appeal in the Mainakiai case affirmed the use of information technology to guarantee the accuracy and integrity of election results and at pages 70 to 71 of their judgment, the judges determine thus, quote, we are satisfied that the electronic transmission of the already tabulated results from the polling station is a critical way of safeguarding the accuracy of the outcome of the elections. The electronic transmission of results was intended to cure the mischief that all returning officers from each of the 290 constituencies and 47 county returning officers trooped to Nairobi by whatever means of transport, carrying in hard copy the presidential results which they had announced in their respective constituency telling centers. The other fear was that some returning officers would be in, would in the process tamper with the announced results. In response, the first and second respondents made concurring arguments on this issue and stated that the litigation logic of the minor Kiai case as an appeal against the decision of the High Court sorts the following orders. A declaratory order that sections 39, 2 and 3 of the Elections Act are contrary to the provisions of articles 86 and 138 2 of the Constitution and therefore null and void that a declaratory, a, declaratory, a declaratory order that regulations 83, 84, and 87 of the elections, general regulations are unconstitutional and therefore null and void. A declaration that the respective constituency returning officers are the persons responsible for the conduct and declaration of the constituency presidential election results. A declaration that the constituency presidential election results, once declared and announced by respective constituency uh, returning offices, are the final results for the purposes of that election. A declaration that the constituency returning offices re possess a fundamental and an 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 and an in any hmm, and an in alienable mandate, mandate to announce and declare the final results of a presidential election at the constituency level, and such declaration is final and not subject to alteration, confirmation, adulteration by any person or authority other than an election court pursuant to Articles 86 and 138.2 of the Constitution of Kenya." End quote. The issue for determination was whether the results announced by the constituency returning officers in respect to the presidential officer in respect to the presidential election were provisional and subject to confirmation by the first respondent. The Court of Appeal upheld the determination of the High Court to the extent that Section 39, 2 and 3 of the Elections Act and Regulations 87, 2 C provide that the results declared by the constituency returning officer are provisional and to the, to, to the extent that the regulation 82.3 provides that the results of the returning officer are subject to confirmation by the first respondent, those, res, those provisions are inconsistent with the constitution and therefore null and void. Mr. Nyamodi, for the first respondent submitted, that the pathway to the final results was demarcated by the constitution, the elections act, and by the judicial <coughs> directions of both the High Court and the Court of Appeal. In the Maina Kiai case and in the National Super Alliance uh, NASA versus IEBC case of, of, of 2017, it was Mr. Nyamodi's submission that it was in reliance of the Constitution, the law, and judicial guidance that the first respondents used Form 34B as opposed to Form 34A as argued by the petitioner to declare the final results of the presidential election. He emphasized that at the time the final results of the presidential election were declared, all Form 34Bs had been collated. 
It was council submission that by declaring sections 39.2 and 3 of the Elections Act inconsistent with the Constitution, the first respondent's ability to change, amend, or alter the results transmitted from the constituency was entirely curtailed. And according to Mr. Nyamodi, the decision of the Court of Appeal in the minor Kiai case extinguished the concept of provisional results. Consequently, the numbers manually entered into the Kim's gate at the close of the poll and transmitted simultaneously to the constituency returning center and the national challenge center bore no status in law. They were mere statistics, although the presiding officer had to show the agents present the entries made for confirmation before transmission. To buttress his argument, Mr. Nyamodi traced the process of a vote as follows. A. Upon the close of polling, the votes cast were counted and the results recorded in Form 34A. B. An image of Form 34A was captured by the Kim's kit and the statistics in Form 34A were then entered into the Kim's kit at all polling stations. C. The presiding officer would then simultaneously relay the statistics and image of Form 34A to the relevant constituency returning officer and to the National Talent Center. D. The completion of transmission of the image of Form 34A was dependent on the availability of 4G, 3G or 4G network coverage. In respect of areas lacking 3G or 4G network coverage, the respondents established alternative mechanisms to ensure completion of transmission of the image of Form 34A. It was, however, clarified during oral submissions that in such instances, the statistics could be sent without the accompanying image. E, in accordance with Section 391C of the Elections Act, the first respondent published the images of Form 34A and Form 34B in respect of the presidential election on its public portal. F, in all polling stations, the presiding officers transmitted the statistics of the results through KIMS, accompanied by an electronic image of Form 34A. G, at the time of the declaration of results of the presidential election, the first and second respondents had in their possession all the forms required in law for the purposes of declaration of the results of the presidential election. Lastly, the procedure adopted in the transmission and tallying of results in of the presidential election was in conformity with the decision of the Court of Appeal in the minor Kiai case. On the basis of this process, Mr. Nyamodi submitted that the petitioner's allegation that the first respondent deliberately predetermined and set itself out on a path of subverting the law by being a law unto itself was unfounded. However, Although Section 44A of the Elections Act empowers the first respondent to set up complementary mechanism for identification of voters and transmission of election results to ensure that it complies with Article 38 of the Constitution, the Court of Appeal directed that the tabulated results electronically transmitted from the polling stations in the prescribed forms was a critical way of safeguarding the accuracy of the outcome of the elections and could not be varied. The rationale for this, I have already said, was so that um, we don't get returning officers trooping all the way to the NTC with hard copies. It was Mr. Nyamodi's submission that despite this conclusion, the Court of Appeal did not declare Section 44A of the Elections Act inconsistent with the Constitution. In addition, he submitted that the determination of the Court of Appeal on the finality of the presidential election results declared by the constituency returning officer also changed the form of the structure of Form 34C. Because the regulation provides that upon receipt of Form 34A from the constituency returning officers upon regulation under sub-regulation one, the chairperson of the commission shall tally and complete 34C. However, the first respondent had to modify form 34C to reflect the entry of form 34B, which was the form introduced by the Court of Appeal to be the source document to determine the winner of the presidential election in place of form 34A. Um, the third respondent submitted that the Form 
B, produced by the constituency returning officers upon telling the results from the polling stations were binding upon the second respondent at the National Tallying Center. And as such, the duty of the second respondent was to tally the forms in 34B only to, pro to produce form 34C. Council uh, for the third respondent also rebutted the petitioner's argument that the declaration of results were made at the county. He, uh, he urged that the declaration of results was done by the presiding officers at every polling station and by the returning officers at the constituency tallying centers and that the role of the second respondent was simply to tally the results obtained from the returning officers in Form 34B at coming in from the constituency. While it may seem peculiar to delve into an analysis, into an analysis of the jurisprudence laid by the Court of Appeal in the Maina Kiai case, in a case other than one on appeal, it's my considered opinion that we can do so through a two-pronged approach. Firstly, this is a court of original jurisdiction in presidential petitions under Article 163, and therefore competent to adjudicate upon a matter of both law and fact in such a matter including the interpretation and application of the Constitution. Secondly, this court's foreboding on the circumstances as present before us manifests its decisions in the case of Anami Levasi Lisamula and the IABC, where Rawal DCJ, as she then was in her concurring judgment said, quote, Therefore, the peculiar nature of the Constitution of Kenya informs the peculiarity of the judiciary in the new dispensation, and more so that of the Supreme Court. The Constitution progressively broadens the area, the arena of lit litigation in this country, and the Supreme Court may remain steadfast in its duty to address itself to issues that may come properly before it. The jurisprudence to be developed by the Supreme Court of Kenya may be bear differences from other jurisdictions in the world because, because of its special terms uh, of this country's charter, which expresses the people's will and which embodies their mutual agreement. While most jurisdictions would command a court to relieve itself of duty by making prompt finding on jurisdiction, Kenya's constitution directs that the Supreme Court takes no rest until all unsettled issues of interpretation and application are resolved. In the Aramat case, it was stated that the Supreme Court's jurisdiction is an enlarged one, enabling it in all situations in which it has been duly moved to settle the law for the guidance of other courts. At the center of the instant case is the impact of the decision of the Court of Appeal in the Minor Kiai case to the constitutional status of Section 39 in its entirety and Section 44A of the Elections Act. The role of the chairperson of the IEBC pursuant to Article 3810 of the Constitution, the overall mode of transmission of the presidential election results from the polling station to the NTC as elaborated in the Constitution, the Elections Act, and the regulations thereunder. It is important to note that no intention of an appeal from this decision was lodged in the Supreme Court uh, within the statutory four, 14 days. Bearing in mind the Supreme Court's constant call to interpret the Constitution, these issues can still engage this court's jurisdiction. This case therefore presents two opposite issues for determination. Whether in conducting the 2017 presidential election, the first and second respondents adhered to the guidelines set by the Court of Appeal in the Mainakiai case. And two, what is the place of this jurisprudence in the conduct of future presidential elections in Kenya? The starting point is to place the Mainakiai case in context. This was an appeal against a judgment of the High Court delivered on the 7th of April 2017 in which the High Court made the following declarations. A, that to the extent that Section 39, 2 and 3 of the Elections Act provides that the presidential election results declared by the constituency returning officer are provisional, it is contrary to Articles 86 and 138 of the Constitution and therefore is null and void. Two, that to the extent that Regulation 87 2C of the Elections General 
Regulations 2012 provides that the presidential election results declared by the constituency returning officers are provisional. It is contrary to Articles 86 and 138.2 of the Constitution and is therefore null and void. C. That to the extent of Regulation 83 of the Elections General Regulations 2012 provides that the presidential election results declared by the constituency returning officers are subject to confirmation by the Commission, it is contrary to Articles 86, 138, 2 of the Constitution and is therefore null and void. That the presidential election results declared by the constituency returning officer are final in respect of the constituency and can only be questioned by the election court. That to the extent that the first respondent interprets Section 39, 2 and 3 of the Elections Act to mean that it can confirm, alter, vary, or verify the presidential election result declared by the constituency returning officer in particular, in that particular constituency, it is contrary to Articles 86 and 132 of the Constitution and it is therefore null and void. The first respondent sought to have the judgment of the High Court overturned. And in arriving in its determination on appeal, the Court of Appeal considered the meaning of Section 1 of Section 39.1c of the Elections Act as amended and observed the following. Quote, from our own reading of all the provisions under review, the authorities relied on, and bearing in mind the history we have set out in detail in this judgment, we are convinced that the amendments to the Act were intended to cure the mischief identified by the then former chairperson of the, of the appellant and other stakeholders. The mischief was the spectacle that all 290 returning officers from each constituency, 47 uh, county returning officers trooping to Nairobi by whatever means of transport, carrying in hard copy the presidential results which they had announced at their respective constituency telling centers. The other fear was that some returning officers would in the process tamper with the announced, with, with, with the announced results. The Court of Appeal also found that the electoral system reforms which were emphasized in the 20. 2016-2017 amendments to the Elections Act was the use of information technology to guarantee the accuracy and integrity of the election results. And it was noted that Section 44.1 required the first respondent in this matter to Establish an integrated electronic system that enables biometric voter registration, electronic voter identification, and electronic transmission of results. And in 44A, notwithstanding the provisions of Section 39 and Section 44, the Commission shall put in place a complementary mechanism for identification of voters' transmission of election results that is simple, accurate, <coughs> verifiable, secure, accountable, and transparent to ensure that the Commission complies with the provisions of Article 38 of the Constitution. Based on these sections, the Court of Appeal held, we are satisfied with this elaborate system the electronic transmission of the already tabulated results from the polling stations contained in the prescribed forms is a critical way of safeguarding the accuracy of the outcome of elections and do not see how the appellant of any or any of its officers can vary or even purport to verify those results, particularly when it is clear by Article 86D, Section 2 of the Act and Regulation 93.1, all election materials, including ballot boxes, ballot papers, counterfoils, information technology equipment for voting, seals, and other materials are to be retained in safe custody by the returning officers for a period of three years after the results of the elections have been, required, have been declared unless required in proceedings of court. The information contained in Form 34, which has sin, since been replaced, following the promulgation of the Elections General Amendment Regulations is primary information that is in itself arrived at after an elaborate process at two levels of the electoral system to safeguard the integrity of the outcome before it is transmitted to the National Tallying Center. Regulation 73 to 90 enumerate the process of counting of votes, declaration, transmission of the results. Once the presiding officer closes the polling station at the end of the voting, he is required in the presence of the candidates to open each ballot box 
and empty its contents onto the counting table and any other facility provided for that purpose. Cause to be counted the votes received by each candidate by announcing the name of the candidate in whose favor the vote was cast. Display to the candidate or the agents and the observers the ballot paper sufficiently for them to ascertain the vote. Put the ballot paper at the place and on the counting table or other facility provided for this purpose designated for the candidate in whose favor it was cast. The total number of votes cast in favor of each candidate is then recorded in a tallying sheet in Form 33. The Court of Appeal further emphasized the centrality of activities at the polling station and held, we bear in mind that we bear in mind that presidential election where two or more candidates are nominated are held in each constituency and the, fourth, the foregoing processes are undertaken at the constituency, the details of which are recorded at the end of the exercise in Form 34. It is inconceivable that those details arrived at after such an elaborate process can be viewed as provisional, temporary, or interim. The inescapable conclusion is that it is final and can only be disturbed by the election court. It is clear beyond peradventure that the polling station is the true locus for the free exercise of the voters' will. The counting of the votes as elaborately set out in the Act and the regulations with its open and transparent and particip participatory char character using the ballot as primary material means that it must, as it must, that the count that is closed with finality not to be exposed to any risk or variation of subversion it sounds ill that a contrary argument that is so anathema and antithetical to integrity and accuracy should fall from the appellant's mouth. End quote. The appellate court expansively interrogated the process of voting as enunciated in Article 86 and was of the view that it was an affront to constitutional values to claim that the second respondent in this case could alone at the National Telling Center or wherever purport to confirm, vary, or verify the results arrived at through an open and transparent participatory process. The Court of Appeal was of the view that Article 138C reinforces the values under Article 86 by requiring the first respondent to tally and verify the count and declare the result in a presidential election after counting the votes in the polling stations. The court interpreted this article to mean that the first respondent could only declare the result of a presidential vote at the constituency tallying center after the process of tallying and verification was complete. According to the appellate court, the second respondent has a significant constitutional role under 138.10 as the authority with the ultimate mandate of making the declaration that brings finality to the presidential election process. The court observed that the second respondent is required to tally all results exactly as received from the 290 officers countrywide in the constituencies without adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing any number contained in the two forms from the constituency tallying center and verification or confirmation related to establishing that the candidate to be declared presidential to be declared president-elect had met the threshold set under 138.4. Now, <clears throat> it is my opinion, no, it was the Court of Appeals opinion that the introduction of section 39.2 sowed discord, mischief, and confusion.